Welcome. Welcome to this presentation, which is part of a series on the historical process of standardization as it applies to the English language. In this edition, in this part, I'll be talking specifically about grammar and about how grammarians constructed their own sense of authority, um, thinking about what, sh what they felt should count as correct and what should count as incorrect. As a kind of preface, I wanted to note something pointed out in an earlier presentation, and that is that during this whole process of standardization, the people who were making decisions, they often did so with an eye to classical languages, especially to, to Greek and Latin. They admired those languages, and that, that admiration definitely inspired some of their efforts related to English. They sought to to either bring English up to uh, the level that they saw Latin and Greek as occupying, or at least to improve it a little bit so they wouldn't have to be so embarrassed about English. Among language standardizers, um, that is the educated people of means and power who were, had inclinations and time to worry about the state of English, among those folks there was a common sentiment that English grammar was deficient. Right, and really part of this sense of the problem stemmed from comparing English to Latin and Greek. They looked at those languages and they saw perfection. While English, in contrast, had a relative lack of systematicity, it really seemed imperfect. And it's not hard to appreciate how they came to these conclusions. If you've studied Latin or Greek or really any language with a well-developed system of inflection, you've probably been impressed with the seeming complexity of that, that grammar, right? You got a, a taste of this earlier in the course when we looked at Old English, right? We saw lots of charts, and graphs and charts and all that stuff. They showed various forms, that nouns and verbs and adjectives and other parts of speech, the various forms that they could take according to how they were functioning in a given sentence um, according to the, gramma to, the, uh, to the grammar of that sentence. By comparison, English looks rather simple, right? We have very little inflectional morphology. And this is the kind of thing that early grammarians had in mind when they considered English to be lacking in terms of perfection. Among the ideas that informed these views about language in the 18th century was this notion of what they called universal grammar, which Robert Loeb or Louth describes as the principles which are common to all languages. This term, universal grammar, is still used in linguistics today. Some of you in other classes may have heard this term, universal grammar. Um, and it has roughly the same meaning, but we tend to approach it uh, from a very different perspective today. To get a sense of what universal grammar meant to someone like Louth in the 18th century, consider this quote here. He writes, the English language hath been much cultivated during the last 200 years. It hath been considerably polished and refined. It hath been greatly enlarged in extent uh, and compass. And here you can imagine he has in mind all the, all the vocabulary that was added, as we talked about in an earlier presentation. But he goes on, but whatever other improvements it may have received, it hath made no advances in grammatical accuracy. <coughs> he concludes, does it mean that Engli the English language, as it is spoken by the politest part of the nation, and as it stands in the writings of our most approved authors, authors, often offends against every part of grammar? Thus far, I am afraid, the charge is true. Right. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the suggestion that the English language offends against every part of grammar kind of an interesting phrasing. He clearly has in mind some ideal form of language that adheres to principles of some notion of a universal grammar. And, and also he, he notes English really doesn't stack up that well to this ideal form of language. And this is very much not what linguists mean when they talk about universal grammar today, right? It's not about an imagined perfect example of grammar but rather linguists mean by this term the common principles that all languages share, right? But for, for Louth, there are languages like, like Latin, like Greek, that play by the rules of universal grammar and others that have clearly gone off course, like English. Okay, so let's think about the work that was being done by grammarians in the 18th century, right? Let's think of it um, as a kind of job. What do you need to be able to do in order to be an 18th century grammar? 
grammarian? Well, first, of course, you need to settle disputes over variable usage, right? People were using different constructions, different ways of phrasing things and so forth, and you need to decide which one is right and which one is wrong and come up with some reason for that. Of course, it's also about codifying the rules, right? Writing down the rules so that other people will know what you decided is right and what you decided is wrong. And you also need to be prepared to correct errors that you find, right? The idea is that um, going out and finding people who aren't playing by the rules, who are violating the rules, that this is a way of improving the language, right? Because you, part of being, part of your job as a grammarian of, uh, of English is you are a self-appointed protector of the language. It's your job to make it better and to protect it from the people who would mess it up. <coughs> I want to talk about two very influential figures at this time, uh, Bishop Robert Louth, who I mentioned, and Lindley Murray. Louth was an Oxford professor and also an Anglican minister who eventually rose to be Bishop of London, so it's a very powerful position in the Anglican Church. In linguistics, he's best known for his work, A Short Introduction to English Grammar, which came out in 1762. Lindley Murray was originally an American who was trained as a lawyer. Um, his family, incidentally, those of you who are familiar with New York City, his family is the one that Murray Hill uh, neighborhood is named after. Um, later in life, Murray moved to England, um, and he's best known to us as the author of the book simply titled English Grammar, which originally came out in 1795, and it was widely um, used as a textbook for school children and others throughout the 19th century, so it had many, many editions after that. And I should note here that these two guys, uh, Louth and Murray, they were not the first writers of English grammars, right? There were other people as far back as the 16th century who were writing about this topic. But these men were extremely influential and offer uh, some of the most comprehensive treatments of this of this subject matter. So that's why we're focusing on them today. The big question I want to concentrate on is this one. How do you adjudicate right from wrong in grammar? Right Today in grammar, as with many other aspects of language, if we have a question about which usages are correct and which are incorrect, we could go somewhere to look it up. These early grammarians, they were the ones who had to decide what's right and what's wrong. And it's important to appreciate how they made those calls, how they justify um, you know, that this is the correct usage and this is the incorrect usage. Right? And just by way of sort of giving you a little spoiler, um, it's all made up. It's all a house of cards. They're just sort of um, coming up with different excuses along the way. But let's look at some of those. One common justification for choosing uh, one usage to be correct and another to be incorrect is to look at what they called the work of the best authors, right? The idea is that the people that we respect as users of English, right, as writers of English, um, those are the ones whose usage is uh, the, what we should take as a model. So you can see this in this quote from Murray who writes, propriety of language is a selection of such words as the best usage has appropriated to those ideas, which we intend to express by them in opposition to low expressions. And you can get a sense of the kind of classism involved here, right? So he's not talking about particular authors necessarily, but um, the kind of people who would use this best usage as opposed to the low expressions. Uh, clearly a, a class dimension to this issue in his view. And even though grammarians tried to appeal to the usage of the best authors, they, they didn't always agree just who those authors were. And sometimes they didn't even agree that the best authors knew what they were doing in the first place. Right? It's very common for grammarians to pick out examples um, from even canonical authors and call those examples uh, mistakes. As Louth notes, they did this um, uh, either because they didn't know the rules, right? As he says here, uh, our best, uh, best authors have committed gross mistakes for want of a due knowledge of English grammar or his other possibility, at least a proper attention to the rules, right? So either they didn't know any better or they did and they just weren't paying close attention, right? Um, of course, as we'll see with some of the examples, the rules they have in mind were often not established for many centuries after these original authors were writing. So they're sort of blaming them for not knowing the rules that would be codified 
several centuries later. Another common justification, I guess if you were to see me, you'd say I'm using air quotes when I say justification here, um, is what we might call ipsy-dixitism. Ipsy-dixit is a Latin phrase which literally means he said it himself. Um, so the basic idea is that a grammarian is simply pronouncing judgment about something and you're, uh, sh you're asked to take it on, on his, take his word for it because he's an authority. I mean, you know, uh, would someone who's not an authority on English grammar write a whole book on English grammar? Uh, I don't think so. Here's a good example of this in uh, uh, Lau's writing here. Um, a very familiar uh, rule probably to you, although the phrasing may not be. He writes, the placing of the preposition before the relative is more graceful as well as more perspicuous and agrees much better with the solemn and elevated style. <coughs> you may not recognize this rule, but this is the um, essence of the rule that you shouldn't end a sentence in a preposition, right? Because one of the most common structures in which you would be prone to end a sentence in a preposition is with a relative clause, right? So if you say um, the computer on uh, the computer I'm writing my book on, the on would be the preposition that is at the end there because of the relative clause um, that I'm writing my computer on, or that I'm writing my book on. So um, here, Lauv is stating that you should move the preposition before the relative pronoun, right? So you should say the uh, computer on which I'm writing my book or whatever. So that's what he's arguing for here. But, but notice the nature of the argumentation, right? Why should you do that? Well, because it's more graceful to do it that way. Um, uh, or it's more perspicuous. Perspicuous, I even had to look that one up. Um, perspicuous means transparent or easy to understand, right? Um, so you can see how these are, these are sort of ideas that he's just claiming, right? He's not subjecting them to any hardcore testing. Um, and they're really his opinion, right? Uh, it's a stylistic judgment. It's more graceful. It fits better with the solemn and elevated style. So these are um, aesthetic judgments, uh, essentially, which is why you have to take his word for it, right? Another um, common way of justifying a rule is by appealing to logic or reason. And probably the best known uh, example of this is the very famous rule about double negatives uh, phrased here. Two negatives in English destroy one another or are equivalent to an affirmative. Right? That phrasing was originally Louds, but um, Murray plagiarized it just verbatim. That was sort of common practice at this time. Um, but if we think about this rule, right, two negatives in English destroy one another, we might uh, more commonly say they cancel each other out, but that's the idea, right? So why is this an appeal to logic? Well, the logic um, is mathematical, right? This is a, a math issue. It's specifically uh, an appeal to the way that mul multiplication works, as you might remember. Multiplying two negative numbers results in a positive number. So that's the logic um, that's applied here. So if you multiply two negative numbers, you get a positive. So if you have two negatives in a sentence or in a phrase, that they should destroy one another or cancel each other out and therefore make a positive or an affirmative. But why that particular logic should apply here is not really explored, right? Why? the logic of multiplication as opposed to the logic of addition, right? If you add two negative numbers, they don't become positive, they become more negative, right? Um, and in fact, that's actually a much more um, appropriate kind of analogy uh, for how multiple negation or double negatives work in English and other languages. Um, but, you know, the broader question might be, why should we look to math at all? Why language is not math? Why should language work like math? Again, it's an appeal to logic. Another example of that is in this uh, uh, quote from, from Murray. He's talking about the uh, f uh, different forms of adjectives. So adjectives that have in themselves a superlative signic signification, meaning do not properly admit of the superlative or comparative form super added. Right. So look at the examples, chiefest, perfectest. So the idea is you can't say perfectist or perfecter because perfect itself already has this meaning of superlative right so you can't modify it with the with the suffix same thing if something is the chief reason 
um, something else it, it, it can't be chiefer and chiefest right so the uh, that's the basic idea and you can see how there's a, a clear logic to that right if it already means this thing you shouldn't add other um, suffixes in this case that that also add that meaning so it's an appeal to logic in that way as I noted earlier the comparison to classical languages like Greek and Latin certainly informs a lot of this work on standardization and this promoted a a general kind of anxiety about how deficient English seemed to be. Um, but sometimes the comparison was even more direct, and you can see that in this example um, from Murray. Here, Murray is considering the question of whether English nouns have separate subject and object cases. Right? You probably remember that this was um, clearly the case huh? in Old English when the form of the noun might change from nominative when it's used as a subject to accusative or dative when it was used as an object right so in Old English they definitely had a, a difference between subject and object cases but that system was lost right it's been lost since Middle English um, and English no longer has distinct forms for nouns as subjects versus objects but Murray argues there's still case in a kind of abstract sense. Look at the quote here. The general idea of case doubtless has reference to the termination of nouns, the endings of nouns. But there are many instances, both in Greek and Latin, in which the nominative and accusative cases have precisely the same form and are distinguished only by the relation they bear to other words in the sentence. Right. So sometimes in Latin and Greek, the word, the form of the noun doesn't change based on whether it's nominative or accusative. He goes on, we are therefore warranted by analogy in applying this principle to our own language. So the nouns of our language are entitled to this comprehensive objective case. It's kind of maybe hard to figure out logic here, but basically he's saying s because sometimes in Greek and Latin there is no formal difference between uh, subjects and objects, between the nominative and accusative forms, Therefore, we can say that English, which never has this distinction between subjects and objects on nouns, um, also has case, right? So even though it, it sometimes shows up in Greek and Latin and sometimes doesn't, and in English it never does, uh, we still can claim that we have it because it sometimes is the same situation in Greek and Latin. It's a kind of convoluted um, thinking, but the, the key is that he's clearly basing his judgment about this basic property of English grammar, whether there's case or not, on uh, the analogy to Greek and Latin. <coughs> An even more extreme example of this kind of thinking, right, is, uh, is something like Thomas uh, Dilworth in his 1783 grammar, where he's clearly trying to fit English into a Latin-shaped hole, right? He, again, is talking about case. Um, those of you who've studied languages like Latin and before know that it's common to think of this in terms of declension. Declension is the different forms of a noun according to case, and you can see his little Q&A at the top of this here. What is meant by the word declension? Declension is the variations of a word by cases. How are nouns declined or varied by cases? And then he gives these examples, right? So what are the different case forms? Well, the nominative case uh, for uh, nominative singular for the noun book is a book. The genitive is of a book. The dative is to a book. The accusative is the book. The vocative is a book. And the ablative is from a book. Right? And then he has uh, similar forms in the plural. And then he has another noun, church, and does a similar sort of thing. Right? The key here is he's claiming that there are uh, six different cases in English, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, vocative, and ablative. How did he arrive at those particular six? Well, those just happen to be the cases that Latin has, right? And so even though, as you can see, the form of the noun, book or church, doesn't ever change according to case, he still wants to say it has different uh, declensions, right? Different de declensional forms um, uh, according to case, right? So he's taking this system of case from Latin and saying it also applies to English, right? Even though uh, the evidence clearly shows that that's not the case, right? The noun never changes form from book uh, or church there, um, but still it represents six different cases, right? Th th one of the sillier things about this is that even in the one example where English does have a distinct case form, right? The genitive, 
apostrophe s he doesn't even do that right he could have said um the book's cover or something apostrophe s to show a dis distinct verb but now he's just wants to use a, a, a preposition to show these different case forms so it's clearly um taking the model of latin and applying it to english another guiding principle um for um grammarians making decisions about how English grammar should work is this idea that distinction should be preserved. Right? We see this in the, in the previous example, argument that English nouns have case differences, right? That's a kind of distinction and they want to try to preserve that from, from Old English in so, to some extent. The feeling was even stronger um, uh, or even so strong that it motivated grammarians to sometimes impose distinctions that didn't really exist. And this is what I mean when I write here that distinctions might also be constructed um, for English, right? And one of the famous examples of this um, as is the one that relates to future tense auxiliaries, the words will and shall. So take a look at how Murray formulates this rule. He writes, will in the first person singular and plural intimates, intimates, right, designates, resolution and promising in the second and third person only foretells. Shall, on the contrary, in the first person simply foretells. In the second and third persons, promises, commands, or threatens. Right. So what is he talking about here? So if you say, I will go to the store, right, that is implying a kind of resolution or a promise. If you say, I shall go to the store, you're simply foretelling the future, right? You're, you're making a simple statement about the future tense. On the other hand, if you say, you will go to the store, then that is simply uh, predicting the future, foretelling. But if you say you shall go to the store, you're commanding or threatening or promising, right? So it's making this person-based distinction um, on the actual meaning of the auxiliary. The beauty of this um, rule, well, there's two things. One, it's extremely complicated and hard to remember, right? And that's always a good thing. Um, when you're a grammarian, you want to have a very complicated rule so that it's hard for people to, to use properly and so that you can then criticize them. Um, but the other thing about this is it is completely made up. There is no basis in history for this division. These two words, you might remember, will comes from uh, an earlier verb that means to wish or to want, right? And shall comes from an earlier verb that means to be obligated or to have to do something, right? So neither of them um, had this distinction. They were never used in this way originally, but at some point a grammarian, and Murray's not actually the first one to formulate this rule. He's repeating something that was formulated um, a little bit earlier. Um, but in any case, this very complicated rule imposes this made-up distinction on how you should use these two words um, and it gets promoted um, from there, right? Again, in American English, we don't really pay much attention to this. To this. Um, we almost never use shall today to indicate future tense. Um, but in, in British English, for example, this rule is still um, taught, at least in some, um, in some contexts. But it's a completely made up distinction. Another very common practice among grammarians is to point out errors in other people's usage. I mentioned this very earlier, uh, very early on in this presentation. As you can see in this example from, from Louth, um, they certainly were not shy about criticizing even major literary figures. So what uh, he's talking about here is the confusion about different forms of the verb, right? The past tense and the participle forms. Um, and he's giving some examples from people he considers to be his best writers, but of course he's pointing out the mistakes that they made. So he gives this example of where Milton writes, have spoke instead of have spoken, or Dryden writes, was wove instead of woven, and Shakespeare has have swam instead of have swum, right? So um, <coughs> he's not afraid to criticize even major literary figures. Um, for their for their grammar, right? And this is all part of finding errors. The this practice of of error hunting certainly continues today. I'm sure you're you're familiar with it, either as a pedagogical instrument or just as a, a form of entertainment. It's very common to see people pointing out supposed mistakes um, in people's writing or in their speech, and then they take those as evidence that whoever was using those things, the writer or the speaker, um, has nothing valuable to to contribute, right? And then I'll return to this point in a, in a later presentation.
want to end by highlighting this very common framing in early grammar books where lessons about English are treated as lessons in good behavior and morality more generally, right? It's no coincidence that Robert Louth was a bishop, right? Many religious leaders have given their opinions about language. They've written about language as a sort of side project. Um, in this quote from Murray, right, you can see an explicit connection between grammar and morality. He's talking, this is from his preface, right, where he's talking about himself. The author has been solicitous to avoid all exceptional matter and to improve his work by blending moral and useful observations with grammatical studies, right? The importance of exhibiting to the youthful mind the deformities of vice and of giving it just and animating views of piety and virtue makes it not only warrantable, but our duty also to embrace every proper occasion to promote in any degree these valuable ends, right? In other words, uh, yes, I'm talking about grammar, but I'm going to take this opportunity to also teach about good morals and being a good, uh, upright, upstanding person, right? Of course, uh, Murray has um, pedagogical goals in mind. He wanted this book to be used for instructing children and, and others, and uh, <coughs> He was probably aware, uh, even at this time, that the children are our future, as some people say. Um, so he took care in his writing to teach them uh, wrong from right, not just in grammar, but in, in life more generally. And this is a very common theme that we'll return to later. Speaking of that, so um, in the next uh, presentation in this series, I uh, want to take up the broader question about how these historical processes of standardization, how they continue to affect our thinking today. They shape our attitudes and just the very way that we conceive English as well as language more generally. So come back for that one.